Hello, uh, hello everybody. My name is Phil Croshaw and a very warm welcome to Passions Live. Uh, and I'm here today with Giles Clark. Uh, we're having some wonderful first world problems with the internet. Uh, so we're going to do our best. Um, if all else fails, uh, we might have to abort it. And then uh, obviously we'll ha just have to do it. I'll just have to do a pre-recording with Giles another time, which I will do. And then we'll put it on the, we'll put it, uh, obviously we'll put it on the, on the channel. Um, so um, let's just try. We'll do our best and hopefully the internet will behave itself. Uh, but as we all know, first world problems, internet glitches and stuff. Uh, that's just what happens with live stream, isn't it? Um, okay, so I'm just going to give everybody a chance to get in. So I'll just play this intro and then we'll get back to Charles and he can talk about all his wonderful work. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I'm Phil Croshaw, and a very warm welcome to this epi episode of Passions Live. And we are live, uh, which means anything, absolutely anything, could happen. Uh, internet's already playing up a little <laughs> bit, as I said, uh, but we'll just we'll just go with the flow. Um, I love my job. I love the work that I do, and one of the reasons I love the work that I do is I get to speak and meet speak to and meet so many really fantastic and really inspirational people. Now, I know Giles probably going to be embarrassed at this point, at, at me uh, praising him like this, but uh, I can honestly say this guy is a real inspiration on a number of levels. So I'm not going to even try to explain who Giles is and what he does. I'm going to ask Giles to explain who he is and what he does. Uh, so this is a test, Giles. This is it, live, li live on air. Giles, oh very warm well, welcome. Tell us who you are and what you do. <laughs> Thank you very much, Phil. To be fair, what, what do I do? I, I have this conundrum every time I come through a different country and have to fill out the immigration form when it says occupation, because what, what do I put in that little box? I, I started life, uh, adult life, if you like, as um, my job or career vocation was um, a zookeeper. But... I think more and more recently, I'd probably describe myself as a, um, uh, a conscious citizen or a conservation in terms of I'm hopefully making a contribution to the natural world, our environment and, and our wildlife. So as I said, right at the beginning of my, my journey, I um, started off at, uh, at a zoo called Paradise Wildlife Park many, many years ago now back in Hertfordshire. And my personal my personal journey has taken me around the world i've worked in various um facilities and zoos and institutes in in different countries but the core behind what i've always done is to try and help make a and, and not just to pay lip service to it but make a a, a significant contribution to trying to keep the animals that I look after keep their their counterparts exactly where they should be, which is which is in the wild. So I suppose that that sums it up. And my journey is has gone off on different paths. And part of that more recently over the last sort of 
eight, seven or eight years has to um, document the work that I do um, with various observational documentaries that have uh, uh, have been on BBC Two, BBC Worldwide, and and gone out around the world. And I, you know, I I've never set out to be a uh, a television presenter or personality. In fact, I can feel my toes starting to curl as I <laughs> as I say those words. That's definitely definitely not my my forte. You know, there's people out there that are much 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 more um polished shall we say at at that aspect but i am very passionate about what i do and being coming from a zookeeper background you know a big part of what we we should be doing is communicating those important messages to to the public to people that come into zoos and see our animals and and doing the observational documentaries um, for television was for me just an extension of that being able to to get those important messages out there when we talk about wildlife and conservation challenges that it that it faces and to try and encourage people to to um, want to get on board and and help make a difference themselves absolutely brilliant so um, if you had to summarize what your passion was, and I don't think you've had time to think about it when we approached <laughs> you to do this. Is it is it animals? Is it making a difference? Is it about conservation on a wider scale? Or is it all of the above? I think it has to be all of the above. You know, like I out of all of the environmental challenges, shall we say, or or, or challenges to the, the natural world at the moment. And there are there are many, and some of them seem, you know, completely overwhelming when we talk about things like um acidification of the oceans or climate change or you know some of those really big top line things but right up there is biodiversity loss you know the the loss of our wildlife of species it's currently thought that we're probably at at the start of what's called the six um mass extinction so to, to summarize that in the history of the planet as we know it, there's been five other mass extinctions of life on Earth for various reasons. Um, those reasons, though, have always been natural. So probably the most famous one that, that everyone knows of six to five million years ago, something happened that changed the climate that caused um, dinosaurs to disappear. Now, you know, the most likeliest theory is that it was a meteorite. But all five of those catastrophic changes um were not caused by humans whereas this one that we're currently in you know we are potentially losing species just as fast if not faster than some of those other mass extinctions and yet categorically it's being caused by human activity and so you know i feel very connected i suppose and and uh passionate about what's happening to our wildlife but it it isn't just about making sure that you know animals have got somewhere to live and our children or our grandchildren you know have the absolute privilege of seeing experiencing and having you know the same inc- incredible array of life as what we do on this planet it goes much beyond that because to save wildlife we're saving ecosystems we're saving habitats those become part of much bigger um bigger landscapes and those landscapes are are not only critical for hundreds of millions of people that are directly dependent on them but in the wider context you know having a healthy um uh having a healthy planet is vital and critical to every single person on the on the planet now you know you could you could use numerous examples of you know the impacts that we have but i think you know there's there's something very real and deep-seated for me uh, having not only worked in zoos i've spent a lot of time working in the uh, contributing and volunteering and working in the field and and again i can use numerous examples of of um you know how conservation if you like is having not just an impact on on wildlife but 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 conservation is having an impact on people and and the story that i use time and time again you know is one that 10 years ago i was um helping to support a project by fauna and flora international in cambodia and it was called the cambodian elephant um conservation group 
and we had an area, a region in um, Cambodia that was, you know, the villages were being heavily afflicted by elephant conflict. So come harvest time, elephants were going into the village and raiding the rice fields and decimating the crops, causing devastation. And, you know, you can imagine that's that's not only people's livelihoods in terms of money, but that's their food as well. That's what they're going to survive on for the year. And so it's difficult to say, well, you know, that's just where you live and that's, you know, part of the natural world. And it's because of us, you know, changing their habitat that they're doing it. And people would retaliate and people would um, kill elephants because of that that conflict. And we did various uh, programs in terms of helping to try and mitigate that um, conflict, but also providing people with alternative livelihoods and alternative means. And part of that was to um, build a school for the area. So this school um, serviced six or seven villages. And I'd seen prior to, to the involvement of the project, I'd seen you know the effects of what was happening and went back 18 months um, maybe two years later, and I was lucky enough to to go into that school. Now, that school, when I say a school, you know, is effectively uh, a shed with a tin roof, but had resources and, and had a teacher that was being um, provided for by the conservation program. And there was a little boy, 12-year-old boy, that stood up on my second visit and read out a story that he had written as to why he felt it was important that um, the elephants in his forest, and these were his words, in his forest should be saved. And, you know, that was touching in itself. But then to find out that that little boy could not read or write six months prior to my visit, and the only reason that he was having that opportunity was because of effectively what is an elephant conservation program, you know, really uh, was humbling and just brought it home. So, so whilst we say conservation is about wildlife and it's about the natural world and it's about, you know, it beyond that, it's very, very much about people. So, you know, conservation has to have those holistic approaches to be sustainable long term, you know, and I think, but in a very real sense, ev everyone can identify that, you know, it should be, should be any child's right to have access to, to school. So to suddenly have a, a young a young boy like that stand up and say, well, actually, this is why we need to be saving the elephants. And, and that opportunity was given to him because of a, of a, of a conservation program. Do you, think, do you think part of the problem is that uh, most of us never get exposed to that, uh, right, you know, up close and personal? I mean, obviously, we 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 all well. Most of us can watch um, uh, documentaries and stuff with David Attenborough and everything else, and but it's still on a screen. Do you think people yeah, don't? Yeah, and I think. See what I mean? I, yeah, I d yeah, definitely. I think, but at the same time, I think it's I think it's a combination of things. And I would say, on a you know, on a completely positive note, you can really now see, it in, especially in the last sort of five maybe eight years there's there's a real shift and look at the younger generations now you know that are are really starting to understand the connection between us and the planet and its wildlife and the ecosystems and the services that they provide much much more so than any other generation before us i think it's because you know it's it there, there is somewhat of a, a, a disconnection by society and you get very easily wrapped up in, you know, in your immediate surroundings and your, mm -hmm. you know, immediate needs and challenges and of everyday and, life and yeah. challenges of everyday <laughs> yeah. life. And you don't, yeah. you don't yeah. necessarily connect, you know, the importance of polar bears in the Arctic or elephants in the forest of Southeast Asia to your immediate needs and existence. But, you know, it, those connections are very, very real. And yeah. but as I said, on a positive note, I think people are really starting to um, starting to, to appreciate that and understand it. You know, the 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 um, concern, if you have, uh, if you like, that I have inside is, is more like, are we are we 
acting fast enough now you know are we starting to and there's always going to be other pressures you know it was like I, it was only this morning that i was reading you know that um uh Trump is now trying to rush through the legislation so oil and gas companies can um, start mining and drilling in the Arctic, uh, in the Arctic refuge in um, in Alaska. And you just think, goodness, you know, like it, 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 it's just it's beyond comprehension. But so you've got those other those other pressures financially and you know, economically. And I suppose, you know, that's one thing that our generation really now starts to need to act upon is that when we talk about wealth, it can't just be in terms of monetary and um, a material sense, you know, we need to be on move beyond the sort of current model, if you like, because yeah, yeah, yeah and you see those, you see those, um, memes and social media all the time but it, it, it is true you know we won't be able to eat money you won't be able to drink money you know our children won't be able to breathe money so we need to move beyond you know that model in economics if you like to go well actually the wealth is going to be in protecting what's vital to all of us yeah, crack it. I mean, it's it's such a massive conversation. We could probably you said you said to me before about how long might this how long this might be lasted, <laughs> and just 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 that sort of area. And I know I wouldn't say that I'm I'm, I'm aware of 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 the conservation challenges. I'm aware of the of the earth, the challenges with earth. I'm not going to say I'm not lie and say I'm a green person because I'm probably not. But I have to say, me probably with most of the planet, when I look at some of these uh, beautiful beaches, for example, with all the plastic you know, just everywhere. It's quite shocking, yeah. actually. It is quite shocking. It brings it home to you, I think. I, um, I, to I totally agree. There's so many yeah. examples. But, but mm. you know, for on that example, and it, you know, when we talk about plastic in the ocean, uh, things like cotton buds and straws, banning those, you know, is, a, is an amazing um, and quite monumental first step. But ultimately, that's what it is. It's a first step because 70% of the plastic that is in our ocean comes from discarded fishing material. So it's great that we're tackling the straws and the cotton buds. But unless we start to put legislation in place that tackles the way in which the fishing industry treat the ocean and the natural world and, you know, treat that as a resource, then, you know, there's still going to be 70% of that plastic is, is still going to be discarded fishing nets, et cetera. So, so great first step, but, you know, stopping straws going down the drain is, is not victory. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, there's a, a comment here from Melanie Phillips just saying shocking at what we're doing to our planet. So thanks, Melanie. Thanks for tuning in. It's great to, to, to see you here today. And um, also got a comment here from uh, Sakeep. Sakib, I think that is. Uh, excellent work, guys. Thanks for sharing. So it's good to see we're appreciated somewhere. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it is so nice. You know, I quite often, after after the various documentaries that I've, I've done in the past go to where I, I do feel overwhelmed by the um, amount of people that are, are engaged are supportive that want to get behind it you know there's 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 um there are a lot of people out there that are now you know on board if you like and understand and you don't even we don't even understand you know as a all the connections you, it, it, there's there's so there's so many examples of you know what we what we do to the natural world and then 30 or 40 years later you know it, it's had a, a a consequence that was totally un unconsidered or unthought of you know like the way in which certain species of of butterfly if you like back in the 60s and 70s you know were driven to almost extinction because we introduced myxomatosis to rabbits because we wanted to eliminate rabbits as a pest but the on flow effect that that had to the ecosystems and the habitats, you know, had consequences that that nobody could foresee. 
So, you know, we need to, I think the overarching message that, you know, if I wanted to people to take something away from our little chat here is that we need to start treating the natural world with the kindness, the compassion and respect, you know, that it deserves. And we can't keep, you know, stomping our feet and traipsing around because beyond our generation, other generations might not have the luxury to, to be able to make the choices. Absolutely. So that takes me nicely on to the cuddly animals. So there are some people, <laughs> some people who are tuning into this, just kind of really interested in the cuddly animals. Uh, I know it's not as simple as that. I'm rightly so. <laughs> yeah, quite rightly so. So uh, I'm going to ask you in a minute just to talk about your work at the Big Cat Sanctuary. Um, do you want to just introduce this video clip uh, that I've managed to pull off uh, YouTube? It's a, it's a couple of jaguars, isn't it? I think uh, if it's the one I think it is, then it's probably our, our new newest, if you like, pairing. So they're they're a pair of um, very young, you know, they are adults, but still very young jaguars that were um, introduced together last year as part of the EEP um, breeding program. So, and uh, I, I think in the video you'll see just how famously they are um, starting to get along. So recently they've been introduced into a new enclosure, a new habitat together as well. And, uh, and hopefully in the not too distant future, that will lead to some uh, pitter patter of some, some tiny, you know, Jaguar paws as well. <laughs> wow! Yeah, and obviously you've, you're currently uh, they're re-showing a number of your uh, shows. Your tiger in the house, and is it bears in the house as well? Is that was that another one you did? I, I, yeah, I can't. To be fair, I can't <laughs> keep up what's what's being shown and and the scheduling then changes yeah. from what's in the newspaper. But I've been incredibly fortunate that you know during this lockdown period, you're right. They've been showing. We've sort of created this strand, if you like, called about the house. So we've got tigers about the house and then I did big cats about the house. And more recently last year, I did another one called bears about the house. And at, and at some point over the last six months, they've all been, um, they've all been repeated, which is, which is fantastic. Makes okay. people jump around a bit though, because they, they look at me in one and then the next week there's another series on and, and I've clearly aged about five or six years <laughs> in just a week. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, you must be doing something right, though, Giles, if they keep repeating them. <laughs> it's better than it was just a one-off show. <laughs> you know what, though? I think, actually, on a very serious note, I think that's, you know, the team that we um, have and I've worked with the entire time at the Natural History Unit of the, the BBC, you know, it's a real testament to the way in which they've creatively, you know, put what we got together because it's, it's, it's family viewing, and yes, there are some cute and cuddly, you know, incredibly charismatic um, baby animals, if you like, in there. But actually, we talk about some of the, ser you know, very serious conservation challenges that these these species face. And we introduce it in a way that at first, you know, with tigers about the house, especially people didn't necessarily even, you know, were aware at the, at, at the beginning that we were, you know, starting to to um to introduce that that conservation element into it so it's not uh, you know whilst i hope people are captivated so there must be some element of uh, entertainment there for them if you like actually it's trying to tackle and deal with and and talk about some of the you know very very uh, serious issues that that wildlife faces yeah no absolutely okay so um let's have a look at these really majestic and beautiful animals then just so we can put some context into the conversation
Absolutely wonderful clip that I, I just I was so glad I found that because there were quite a few choices, but I just thought it was absolutely fantastic. Um, looking at those beautiful, ana beautiful animals, a lot less scary. Getting, al getting along famously, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, a lot less scary than seeing you rolling around your lit lounge with a really great or two really great tiger pups on the on the show on the tv show <laughs> as i said to you before we came on air I, I used when i was watching i was thinking god that one of those tigers is going to take his head off at any minute do you ever feel, feel that jeopardy do you ever feel at risk when you're in that situation well we should say you know that well in case people are not aware of the the um different programs if you like when i was based in australia i was at um uh, a zoo called australia zoo which was um uh, Steve Irwin's zoo, so the crocodile hunter, and we had there we had a uh, quite a unique policy, if you like, that we had a hands-on interactive um, relationship with the cats that were in our church, so the ones that we were looking after, and we did that for for various reasons. First and foremost, I, and I, you know, I still truly, truly believe this. I could provide those tigers with an incredible quality of life, that hands-on relationship. So they're not tame, they're not domesticated. You know, we had we had a relationship that was based on mutual respect, but ultimately they are still wild animals, you know, and we have to treat them with such. But we could do a whole variety of things and um, uh, keep them enriched in a way that, you know, just it wouldn't be possible otherwise. And so, First and foremost, you know, our animals were incredibly happy and incredibly well looked after. But beyond that, you know, we talk about audiences. It was captivating for people that used to come along to Australia Zoo. You know, we would always have, we used to call them handlers, carers, keepers in with the cats. Now, like typical cats, you know, 80% of their day would be spent fast asleep. But I still would have those keepers in with the cats that would then be able to um talk to the guests through the through the enclosure and and people were fascinated you know and that allowed us to convey a much um stronger message uh, with conviction that and then engaged people to want to act and and make a contribution so um you know our enclosure that was called the tiger temple at australia zoo would raise hundreds of thousands of dollars every year that we then put back into supporting on the ground conservation projects you know not not tens of thousands hundreds of thousands and that's yeah. you know we did we, we were clever in the way in which we, we you know we conveyed and communicated that message and we would encourage the cats to be active at certain times so so people could see them up and about but you know the animals were never never um forced now again for various reasons the amount of resources in terms of keepers and um hard resources enclosures and what have you that was that was possible where i was at that particular time at australia Zoo. that doesn't necessarily mean that i'm suggesting that everyone you know or a, a, every institute and zoo should suddenly rush out and have a hands-on policy so when i moved over back over here and at the big cat sanctuary we didn't have a hands-on interactive policy with big cats, but I ended up having to um, ham rear Maya, which is a, a young jaguar, for from a welfare perspective. You know, it was critical for her that she was ham reared; otherwise, she would have um, she would have died. And so, you know, there's there's two different, if you like, reasons there as to as to why I ended up interacting and having a hands-on on policy, but. You know, as long as you treat them with um, respect, as long as you know your boundaries, you know, and you have to have experience. I didn't just suddenly jump in with, you know, a whole bunch of tigers or a jaguar cub. I've been incredibly, incredibly lucky and privileged to um, have had a, a many, many years experience working under those circumstances. And so, you know, you combine those things you, you would never say it's risk free, but then what in life is risk free? Because if you if you happen to be driving on a motorway today, you're taking a risk. 
but it's calculated and you do things along the way to try and mitigate the chance of having having a situation or a, or an accident so you know it's exactly how i would describe what we did you know we would put in processes and policies and procedures along the way um but you you know nothing in life life is is guaranteed but i truly feel or felt at the time that the benefits you know outweighed you know what um uh, what potentially people would call the negatives if you like yeah no it makes absolute sense uh, okay so melanie's got a question for you then giles um kira are near and are obviously amazing how is the situation in the amazon at the moment and how are the charities that the big catch sanctuary supports coping in the pandemic okay well there's two two questions rolled into one there i think um let, let we we'll start with the Amazon. Uh, I'm sure that everyone's aware that the Amazon at the moment, you know, natural landscapes and ecosystems are under pressure all around the world. You know, whether it's whether it's the Amazon or whether that's the some of the savannas and plains across Africa. There's pressure by people. Ultimately, as our population increases and our demand for resources increases. You know that puts pressure on what few remaining natural places are left and either for direct resources or we're converting it to agriculture um and so that's exactly what's happening in the amazon at the moment you know unfortunately the the current president um it, it seem you know seems to have somewhat of a, a harmful um policy if you like he has encouraged uh uh communities and people and corporations and business to go out and and um, level parts of the forest to convert it to agricultural land so so the amazon is under ever increasing pressure and it's and it's always been under pressure but that has significantly you know ramped up and what we're finding is you'll get you you might have heard you know about the various tipping points that we now have um environmentally and that's where we have such a significant impact on a on a service if you like or something that's provided by nature that once we push it beyond that tipping point there's nothing we can do to stop it there's nothing we can do to reverse it and it becomes self-perpetuating mm. and so even though the amazon for example is um a rainforest a tropical rainforest you know it creates its own environment so the forest creates its own um environment in terms of the moisture that that's then um uh, absorbed as a part of the climate that then falls again as rain and that and and we have significantly changed that to the point where you know parts of the amazon are now classified as savannah not rainforest so it gives you an idea of the amount of pressure now that's not to say that it, it, it it's too late you know that's the one thing you know although it always sounds you know we're talking negatively and pessimistically optimistically you know it isn't too late i think we have time to halt and to to slowly start to reverse what we're what we're doing but we we're not talking a lot of you know a lot of time we're not talking next generation or or decades it has to really start you know today um and so yeah the amazon like many other places around the world is in a lot of trouble i would say you know there's another organization that i help represent and i'm incredibly um proud of is uh, uh being a vice president of fauna and flora um international and their projects are across many many countries across over 40 countries in the world actually and we've got a, a program at the moment in belize which is buying up tracts of habitat that would otherwise um be sold onto agricultural business and, and saving those connective corridors if you like and and there's an exciting project that we're working on as i said in in belize and it potentially could be the largest block of um uh natural habitat and forest from the mayan mountains right down to the to the ocean so over a million acres eventually which is going to be um fantastic and and that has um viable populations of wildlife not least the uh, uh, jaguars as well so you know that's something that i'm i'm excited to get my teeth into but um going back to 
the question of the pandemic and the big cat sanctuary, like any any other facility, any other charity, you know, the pandemic is starting to have a significant impact on our on our resources. So um, although we're not at the big cat sanctuary like a typical zoo in terms of open to the public, yeah, you know, per se. So they, so we have you know, guests totally coming in. Uh, yeah. yeah, we do. Yeah. Ex- we do do exclusive um, tours, and we do exclusive overnight stays. So we are still very heavily reliant on on public, <clears throat> you know, paying to have one of those experiences. And obviously, we can't do those at the moment, and and we can't deliver them. Um, and so, you know, things will start to get very 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 difficult um over over the winter you know and there's lots of other lots of other um zoos i mentioned paradise wildlife park which is where i started my journey that's actually our sister park at the big cat sanctuary you know and even to the point where we have an appeal out at paradise wildlife park for people to help support us with um food for the animals so you know fingers crossed with some of the other schemes that are um uh, out there to help support businesses that you know it's starting to have you know somewhat of a of a um a positive impact not positive but you know it's going some way yeah. to helping towards the the situation but definitely definitely very difficult and i think what for me what will be at the big cat sanctuary you know one of the really difficult aspects to deal with is you know we've got 50 animals that are in or nearly 50 animals that are in our care, you know, they have to be our, our first priority. But we also support, last year, we supported help uh, over, support over 30 different conservation projects, programs, individuals that are mm-hmm. working in the, in the field at the coalface, you know, trying to protect these species, trying to protect their habitats, et cetera. And, and unfortunately, you know, we, we're not going to be able to, probably be able to deliver the same amount of support this year because you know first and foremost we can't not be feeding our cats not be giving them the veterinary care that they need so you know we need to look at where we can where we can make um some savings so we will still be supporting in situ conservation but but not to the level that any of us really would want to you know and that that's um that then has a knock-on effect because some of those other organizations that we support uh, are you know quite small themselves and every penny matters to them so all of a sudden if they're not receiving the four five six thousand pounds that they would have got from us necessarily then it, it's going to have an impact and that's what we're seeing you know with the with the the pandemic is the impact beyond you know humanity if you like and and what it's having the effect that it's having on conservation there's there's places in africa where um the 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 tourism dollar so people going along and staying not only helps communities in terms of providing employment at lodges and and camps but also helps to support you know the 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 national park service all the rangers and all of that's been literally pulled out from underneath them overnight so so if people have got no income and you know they've got the resource of of uh, a national park right on their doorstep and you've got a family to feed you know people are going to start doing what whatever is necessary and um, and that again will further increase the pressure on on the habitat and and the wildlife so it's a it's a double-edged sword but just yeah. to finish up on the pandemic yeah. you know i think people people need to there's a connection you know the pandemic has most likely come from the way in which we treat the natural world so it it covid19 or coronavirus is a zoonotic disease it started in wildlife now i should want to put caveat in there this is not wildlife's fault you know it's the way in which we've treated it that Mm. this has come about so more than likely COVID-19 started in one of these wet markets. Now people say, oh, there's wet markets all around the world. Well, this isn't a wet market like a fish market in the Bronx in New York or Billingsgate in London. You know, these wet markets that we're talking about in certain areas of the world, yes, you've got um, 
domesticated so-called domesticated livestock products like pork and beef and and chicken and ducks but it sits alongside wildlife and quite often that wildlife is a live wildlife and it's been taken out of the wild and kept in such horrendous conditions that they're all on top of each other you know you've got animals that are dying through stress or through um, dehydration you know and those zoonotic diseases mutate and pass from species to species and eventually make the crossover into um, into animals um, sorry into into humans so very realistically you know we're, we're talking about the impact that the the pandemic has on humans on society on charities you know and i'm talking about how that has an impact on on the natural world and conservation but very realistically you know it's it's come it's come full circle because we're, we're not just talking about you know coronavirus either we know that the likes of sars originated again in exactly the same mechanism that i'm talking about mm. so did ebola back in the day so did hiv you know so again we need to it can't be business as as usual we can't get over this next year because you know haven't we been so clever and we've created a vaccine in 12 months and then just carry on you know completely treating the natural world with disregard and, and disrespect you know we need to we need to learn these lessons we need to learn them quickly and for me again you know how barbaric and horrid wildlife markets are having the you know absolute horror of of going through more than i care to remember you know it's just it's there's alternatives you know i was about to say that it's not necessary and some people would argue well there are probably millions of people that are reliant or dependent on the um on on what they provide but we're talking about millions of people billions of people around the world have been affected by the coronavirus and when we talk about what it's cost it's going to have cost trillions if not yeah. hundreds of trillions yeah. at the end of the yeah. day if we can't come up with a sustainable holistic compassionate alternatives you know with this lesson right under our nose then i don't know what it's going to take it feels, Giles, to be honest, it's almost like it's now or never. It feels that way. You know, I mean, we've, we've finally, for crying out loud, got out of our cars. You know, and, and one of the things that I know we can get into is an element of controversy sometimes in these things. But what used to strike me um, just before the pandemic, when there's a lot of talk about saving the planet and the planet is under pressure is how people would say oh yes it's awful look at all the plastic oh yes the, look at all the graphs and all that kind of thing and they say anyway i'm just going to nip to school now i'm going to drive my kids half a mile down the road in my range rover 17 uh, miles to the gallon if i'm lucky gas guzzler and then i'm going to jump on an, an airplane just to nip over for a couple of days for a business meeting in new york you, you know it, it felt as if it was oh yes it's awful but then it was back to normal so it seems to me that if it's almost like now or never, if we can't, as you said, if we can't adapt now in a situation like this, then will we ever? It, it, well, exactly. You know, and, <laughs> they, and I think, we, we, again, we, we don't really, we shouldn't have the choice in this aspect. You know, we have to, we have to for, for ultimately, you know, and I said it and I don't want to sound like I'm trying to over uh, dramatize it, but we, for the sake of future generations, we have to change. We we have to, because because we know the impact that we're having, you know, and we know that if we don't change, what the potential consequences would be, you know, like I, that I can't imagine there's many sane people around the world that would want to play Russian roulette, in terms of you know the when you see the the yeah. The old westerns where they put the one bullet in and spin the barrel like but that's what we're doing with the environment so even if you 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 occasionally hear cynics that say oh well you know this is natural selection it's natural that species go extinct and it's natural that the climate changes but if you even if you use that as a as a um an argument we know what we're doing 
is having such a negative effect. So why wouldn't we want to change that anyway? You know, why wouldn't we want to change that anyway? And I think, a, a, yeah. a, you know, and I think when we talk about uh, crude oil, if you like, as a um, as a resource, I think it was, oh God, it's a few years ago now. I think it's a, um, a quote from Arnold Schwarzenegger. But, you know, he says he says exactly that. Even if burning oil, fossil fuels, um, you know, the climate skeptics are saying that, oh, well, it would be happening anyway. Even if it if it wasn't, the amount of hundreds of thousands, we talk about coronavirus, the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that die from pollution every year because of burning fossil fuels, oil and coal, etc. If we could change that, then A, why wouldn't you? And sort of the fact that going back to when I said earlier, I was reading about um, uh, America's outgoing administration is is drastically trying to rush through legislation to be able to drill even more areas that should be you know left pristine. But why why would you want to be investing in it now? Why it it would be like in two thousand and three saying that you want to invest in blockbuster video stores? You know, like it's 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 old. You know, we've got alternatives that are better. So we should be moving on. Absolutely. Um, I've got a question here, actually, from Sorrel. I think it's Sorrel. Um, and Sorrel's saying, how do I do what you do in my career? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know what career Sorrel has. I'm, just... <laughs> I'm but... assuming, and here's an assumption, but I'm assuming perhaps uh, they're thinking about either they're in a job or a career that they don't enjoy, they're not passionate about, uh, or they're young and they're trying to decide what they, what they are passionate about. Is it possible to, I suppose I'm going to put a question to it on the assumption, is it possible to do what you've done in, in, their, in their career today that you've done in the past? Is it, is it possible to replicate your journey? And if so, what would they need to do? Oh my goodness! I again, like I can't. <laughs> in terms I didn't of say the questions, were going to be easy, did I? No, but I, I think I've been so fortunate. I, I, I'm so privileged. I've met, like you said, you know, in terms of people you meet, I've met mm -hmm. some incredible people along the way. Some people that have believed in me and helped me on my my journey and given me opportunities. Now, I, you know, and I can't say that that you know other people could could be replicate it, and other people take their own. You know, I look at I look at some people in the field. I, I seriously mean this. I look, and I'm so lucky. I look at some people in the field, and I think oh, I'd love to do what you do. You know, I'd I'd love to spend 300 days a year tracking lions in the wild. You know, and putting collars on them, and learning about individuals and prides and the ecology, and 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 I think in terms of you know, people need to follow their passion and they need to follow their dream and you need to work towards, you know, work towards that. In terms of working with animals, if people want to work with animals, there's there's so many amazing courses out there now. Like 30 years ago when I was starting out, there was a there was a course in one course in City and Girls. You know, now there's there's entire um, colleges that are set up for animal care and um, different courses pertaining to the environment and conservation and that. So, so, um, but you know, it's always walking that fine line. You, 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 you want to, um, you want to make sure that people know who you are, you know, you ask questions, um, and, and I've been pushy in the past, but I don't think I haven't come across hopefully that, you know, I've overstepped the mark and been, annoying i suppose is the best way to, to put it which i'm sure i'm sure there'll be some people out there that would uh, contest that but so is to have a passion but in terms of you know what i do i try and i try and um just be conscious of of what we are doing to this planet and how can i how can i play my part you know to make a positive contribution. Have you had to make sacrifices along the way? I mean, obviously, you, 
you moved to Australia. Um, w have there been sacrifices in that journey that when you look back? I think, I think at the time I didn't necessarily, you know, and I still don't now look at them as sacrifices because I was, mm -hmm. um, you know, loving what I was doing and really truly believed. But I, I've worked, a, a, you know, at the beginning, especially of my career, like I spent 18 months in India um, effectively working in a voluntary capacity for um, a tiger conservation project. Amazing privilege, absolutely incredible. I got to do and see things that, you know, at the time were part of my wildest dreams. But I was doing it in the voluntary capacity. Like I wasn't, I, I wasn't, I was having some of my costs covered, but I wasn't earning from it. I wasn't living. And so you could, you could say that that was, you know, somewhat of a, of a sacrifice and a challenge at the time. And like, you know, I think there's, there's other examples that I could use. So I think sacrifice is too, too big or too hard a words. You know, I've done things and, and, um, I've definitely done things that make me feel very uncomfortable but I've done it because I've believed that it's making a contribution. Like I, I promise you that, you know, I'd rather get in an enclosure with a tiger than, than do a, a public speak to 10,000 teenage children, which I've done in the past, you know, walking out on that stage, I had that overwhelming feeling of the blood just draining from my, my limbs because there was that overwhelming <laughs> sense of panic. And I thought, what am I doing this for? And then I thought, well, I'm doing this because there's 10,000 young people out there that, you know, ultimately they could all help change the world. And some of them could go on and do, you know, great things. So, so yeah, I've definitely, if not made sacrifices, done things that have pushed me outside my comfort zone. Fantastic. Including, of course, the TV stuff. So when you did the TV stuff, was that like, oh, yeah, fantastic? Or was it like, uh, not so sure about this? <laughs> no, honestly. So again, you know, you only have to ask the ask the uh, the series producer that I work with all the time. <laughs> it's like it's, it's not. It doesn't necessarily come natural to me in terms of what comes natural is doing what I do, um, and um, uh, and being passionate about that. I suppose, but having there's some sacrifices if you like having a television crew attached to you so when we did tigers about the house and i i had those tiger cubs in my house for um five or five or six months you know to produce those four hours of television we shot 400 hours so you could say there's there's some definite sacrifices to having a <laughs> having a tv crew over your shoulder every waking moment and sometimes not even when you're awake when you're asleep over over yeah. over your shoulder so so um yeah again it's just that sort of oh god it makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable but i i do it and i just be myself in the end and i've got used to it now and sometimes i just i will be having a conversation let's say with um matt who was the CEO or is the ceo of free the bears that i was working with in in lao and i just i just get to the point where i pretend or i forget that, that that it's even even there and i usually can just get on with it then <laughs> oh that's that's absolutely fantastic right well i'll tell you what i'm going to bring it to a close there but there's so much more <clears throat> i'm going to try and get you back on at some point for part two yeah i'd love to do another so, one it's been fantastic <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can run but you can't hide giles that's <laughs> the uh, uh that's the thing so just a couple of uh, comments just probably it's worth mentioning here uh, from karen karen collins Finger, uh, fingers across for baby Kira and Niran's in the future. <laughs> which is very nice. And, I think she's uh, going to be a fantastic mum as well. You know, you know, sometimes it comes very instinctively to to a lot of cats, but there, there's a there's a, I think she's going to be a great mum. Great. Okay, uh, Melanie is just brilliant to hear about saving the rainforest corridors with flora and fauna. Such a shame that human action has ultimately caused the pandemic. Uh, you might get quoted on that, actually, mate, on the six o'clock news. Thank you for answering the questions. You're very, very welcome, and uh, obviously all about the big big cat sanctuary and as soon as i can which is fantastic and then uh, our final final comment I'll, I'll close here connor and alderson uh giles seems like a genuine dude 
You seem like a genuine <laughs> dude, dude. <clears throat> uh, loving the talk, guys. So uh, that's great, Con. I'm delighted so that kind. you enjoyed it. So I'm just going to say a very quick thank you as well to Spencer Phillips, who's uh, joining me now on the spe- on the um, passions journey. We've got lots of plans for the future, and Spencer's been amazing at introducing me to great people like uh, like this chap here, Giles. So thanks for that, Spencer. So um, we'll close it off there. We've, we've we've I think I said it might be 20 25 minutes, and we're nearly an hour. So uh, <laughs> it not only happens. It's when flown by though, it, hasn't it? And we've, it has. we've had no glitches, which is amazing in itself. <laughs> I know people will be saying now, what what is he on about the broadband? Yeah. But you always you know it's the jeopardy, as I said before we came on air, the jeopardy when you go live stream is just so much different than when you when you just click the record button and you can edit it and stop it and everything else. But hey, just gotta go with it and, and do the fun stuff. And at least it means people can ask questions and everything. So Giles, thanks ever so much for joining me. I, I really thank, do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I, and, and I appreciate uh, yeah. the opportunity as well. Thank you. Yeah. And, and good luck with everything. I hope everything goes okay. Uh, do you want to just uh, tell people how they can find out more about the big cat sanctuary or if they want to uh, provide any help with funding? How do they Definitely. get into the, the easiest way is check out the website. So all the <laughs> W's, bigcatsanctuary.org. Um, and there's there's a whole raft of ways, you know, whether whether people are looking for a quirky uh, Christmas present, then you can you can gift an adoption of one of our cats or, you know, we're still taking bookings for experiences and stays just can't deliver them at the moment. But even if you, you know, you sign up and you you, um, you know, put the deposit down for one of those, you know, there's or, or make a donation. You know, there's lots of ways in which people can can get on board and. You know, there's quite a comprehensive um, uh, uh, website, you know, with our partners in terms of conservation partners, etc. So, Brilliant. And then the the In the House various series will probably be on catch up at the moment as we speak. And it's today's the 18th of November because it's it'll probably on catch up, won't it, on iPlayer or something? De- yeah, 100%. Mm. So Bears, Bears definitely. So Bears mm. um, only went to air for its first time in, in the summer and it stays on for 12 months. I'm not sure about um, Tigers and Big Cats <clears throat> that they've um, shown again recently because they're repeats. I don't know whether they put them on player, but definitely, definitely um, Bears. Fantastic. Right. Okay. We'll call it a day. Giles, thanks ever so much again. All the best, mate. And I hope uh, you have uh, the rest of the covid situation treats you kindly or relatively (laughs) kindly and uh, obviously as as we say to each other nowadays please stay stay safe and i'll catch you again very soon thank you 